Hi. Welcome to a time of scripture and prayer and thinking. Uh, I invite you now to center yourself in the best way that you know how, whether it's the breathing in and the breathing out, whether it is a line of scripture, uh, maybe one that you have memorized, candle flame, whatever it is, uh, I invite you to center yourself. And if you like my focus words, you find those helpful, today I'm offering Beloved. So, let us center ourselves. Hopefully you're feeling balanced from that centered, balanced place. Let's be together in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. We turn to you, Lord. We try not to get worried, try not to turn on to problems that upset us, and trust that everything's all right. Now, Lord, let the world turn without us for now. Help us to close our eyes in prayer, relax, and think of nothing for now. Everything's all right, yes, for we are your beloved and you are our beloved. Open our ears to hear your songs. Amen. the lighting of a peace candle. We do it because we like peace. We like people to know that we follow the Prince of Peace and we probably need the reminder about peace. Speak with me if you know the litany. When there is peace in the heart, there is peace in the home. When there is peace in the home, there is peace in the community. When there is peace in the community, there is peace in the nation. When there is peace in the nation, there is peace in the world. May peace begin right now in each of our hearts. Peace be with you. Let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our scripture 
comes from Luke's Acts of the Apostles, the 15th chapter now, verses 1 through 18. In it, Luke writes, Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church. As they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence, listening to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other people may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles, over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. That ends the reading for today. May God add a blessing so that we might have understanding.
So in this chapter, we have Luke's ongoing story uh, description of how Jesus started this new understanding, this way of being faithful, and how the apostles and disciples uh, eventually began to understand it themselves a little bit, and how it, it, how God moved it forward and outward, expanding and including more and more people, not just people uh, who were Jewish, but now Gentiles. And, and how that seemed to be good, but the question of how, how, what do they have to do has come up. Uh, in my pastoral letter, and, and if you don't get that, please let me know. I can make sure that you do. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, the process, uh, how the early church came to this theological uh, decision. And um, I'm not going to go and tell you all of that again. Um, since writing that, there's a phrase or, or two that has, has really caught my attention and I have been meditating on. Um, and it was, it was one of Peter's phrases. He said, and the God who knows the human heart. It's a pretty good one. Um, James had a good one too um, when he was talking about the Gentiles um, and, and God wanting a people for his name out of them. Um, those, those are pretty cool. Um, now Peter uses his phrase a God who knows the human heart uh, as a way to say that God knows both Jews and Gentiles their hearts and treats them the same way, cleansing them with faith. Um, and Peter seems to be making the point that God knows Gentiles and wants a people for his name. And who are we? To get in God's way. If God knows their hearts and God wants them, that should be good enough for us, right? Seems good. A God who knows the human heart. So, after a few days with, with that phrase, um, I think I'm hearing it differently than I, I once did. And I'm not exactly sure where I heard an earlier understanding of that. Um, you know, I can well imagine it was, you know, Sunday school or my teen years when, you know, somebody would have said something along the lines of, God knows in your heart what you think and are doing. And that's always, you know, um, how I heard it, uh, kind of like a, a warning or more accurately, a threat. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of humans? The shadow and, and God knows. So look out and be good. Don't try to hide your lurking desires and habits and actions and thoughts. It'll do you no good. God will punish for them because God knows what's in the human heart. The shadow, too. And, and yeah, yeah, I think that there is all of that in the phrase, a God who knows what's in the human heart. And if it keeps you living as God wants, uh, the way God calls, uh, the way that God blesses, cool. Absolutely. By all means, remember that God knows what the shadow knows. But let's, let's not stop there. Let's keep this line of thinking going a, a little bit farther. 
God knows. Well, knows how you treated siblings, uh, the times that you you lied or cheated at games or didn't correct a, a bill when there was some error uh, in your favor, um, the times when we have lacked honesty in romantic relationships and maybe the immature ways we have ended those relationships. Um, uh, God knows that we still feel like we owe something uh, to somebody uh, and how there were times we really didn't want our own children anymore. Uh, and, and, and God knows the names, the horrible names that we have called people. Of course, that's the little stuff. God also knows the big mistakes, the errors, the sins that sit heavy on our heart. God knows all of that too. I, I just don't think I want to name them, um, and I don't think I need to. Uh, I, I think we know them. I think we know them all too well. So does God. And the shadow. But let's keep this line of thinking going forward. All right? Um, God knows what's in the human hearts. So, yeah, God knows some of that lurky stuff. But... God also knows better than us why siblings always get the sort of treatment that they get, having more to do with somebody's need to individuate themselves or compete for parental love, care, attention. Um, uh, God knows that sometimes we do correct a bill even if it's in our favor. God knows that we treat romance with immaturity because we were immature. God knows why we were immature. And God knows that we then grow and we do better and even better. God knows the guilt of the owing uh, of this debt. And God knows that there are times when we have paid such debts and there are times when we have forgiven such debts. God knows what's in the human heart and if it was that simple to, to repay some of these debts, we would have. And God knows what has caused our anger so that people have earned the names that we have called them, and sometimes the revenge. God knows that this is a part of any human heart, expressed in individuals in many ways, but none of it is really unusual for humans. And what we might call big sins are a part of us. God is aware how our hearts ache around these things, how our guilt weighs on us. Guilt for past and present things, and for the particularly foolish people, future guilt. Um, all of this is in our hearts. All of this is known. And it doesn't seem to matter to God. Un undoubtedly, God would want something different for many of these situations. God has shown us what is good, and we don't always do it. And God would like us to do these better things. But that we don't always doesn't seem to matter in that our hearts 
are cleansed by faith. And through that we become a people for God. It's pretty cool. We become a heart for God's name. This is much more of who our God is. One who knows the human heart. And thanks be to God, we are known, cleansed, and beloved. I spent some time staying on this line of thinking. And here's something else I, I found going down that line. I don't know why it is, and I think it's kind of mean, that we think that God only knows and only pays attention to those things that are lurking in our hearts, the evil uh, that lurks there. Um, never mind that most of that lurking stuff is not really evil or even sinful. It's just bad, sad, and human. Um, but God knows, too, all the times we stood up for our siblings, the times we overtipped uh, the kind and gentle words at just the right time, how we have paid debts and forgiven them, how we repent of the name calling and sometimes show enough patience so that we find out why this person is earning the name that we want to call them. God knows that too. God knows the times of courage when we have said, no, I don't think that's funny. No, that's not right. No, I don't want any part of that. Those times we've stood up to uh, injustice or, or hatred or uh, any of those things. Uh, those times that we have made lives better, saved lives, impacted on lives. Um, we won't know all of the occasions. But God knows that because of a word that we have given, kindness, a, a, a gift, an offering, uh, a contribution to something, we have done good. And God knows all that too. And God loves us for all of that. I believe there is more of these things um, in the human heart, in your heart. More things of light than of shadow. And I think you know that, too. I don't know why we focus so much on those things that we consider to be stains. But I think you know that there's more of the light in our hearts than the stains. And you don't really want to think it, let alone say it, <laughs> because you're going to be afraid that it's um, prideful bragging and God will see that as a stain and then punish you for that. Um, but I think you can and should admit that it's there and be proud of the good and the light in your heart. At least be glad for the light in your heart. I think God is glad. Our God is the God who knows what's in the human heart. And God knows that we have been hurt. Our hearts have been wounded, bruised, bashed, and broken. And our God knows this, and our God heals our hearts. <laughs> That's who our God is. God knows what's in our hearts. God cleanses them. 
God loves and is made glad by what God knows in our human hearts. And God heals our hearts. And it's all of these things that makes God God and not the shadow. So obviously, I want you to love God and not the shadow. Amen. Let us bring our hearts together and pray. Lord of heaven and earth and all else that is, we are humbled to walk in your presence. We are awed by your nearness. We are overwhelmed with your love. Again, we ask, who are we? that you attend us and treat us like angels, for we know we are not. We know there are dank places in our past, dim places in our hearts, and fear in our actions. And yet your love redeems, your call is to serve, and your embrace is everything to us. In the quiet of the night, we remember that our money, family, nation, and commitments are not as valuable to us as you are. In you, we have our security, our future, our goal. In you, we have our God and Lord. Keep our life quiet so we will remember you in the noise of daylight as well as in the quiet of the night. Keep cancer and wars and politics and family drama and pandemic and economy and all the changes we do not approve from intruding on us. In the quiet, may we hear you speak your calm and strong word of good news to all things that would create noise to block out your words and our faith. Grant us the ears to hear and the faith to deny these problems the power to crumble our trust in you. Grant that we face all such trials as challenges and not disasters. Grant that we remember to face them with you. May our awe and wonder mellow into a simple gratitude, one that does not need constant words or even actions, but one that smiles and delights in the small awarenesses of your love and need only acknowledge to you that we know they come from you. Help us to leave the loud clanging cymbals and noisy gongs of celebrating and praising you to those who need to convince themselves. May all our praise be from our hearts and souls and directed only to you. 
and if our awe overcomes us with a joy that bursts into public displays, may you take delight in it as a confession of our faith. We owe so much to you and your love. The words, thank you, seem bland and weak. They don't say all that we want them to say. Still, we say them. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Amen. And now, now may the love you have found leave you walking on sunshine. May the joy that shines out of you remind others we are starlight. And may we let our love light shine. Amen and Amen.